Welcome to Fun with History with Professor Banks. We are on our journey on history, and today we're doing history lesson number four. And today we're going to go into one of my most favorite places, although I've never been there, but um, it's a very, very fascinating culture and land. A land that is responsible for many things that we have today in our society, the birth of many things in our society. So today, we're going to dive into the land of Greece, and we're going to look at um, a couple, the first beginning civilizations of Greek, and then we're going to look at a couple of major first cities in Greek. So, without further ado, let's get into this history lesson today of, I've entitled it, the, Mi the Minoans, the Mycenaeans, and the Greek Dark Ages. Let's begin. Welcome to our history lesson today on Greece. And today, we're going to dive into the land of Greece. Now, if you recall last week, we looked at the beginning of human civilization. And it began in a region called Mesopotamia, which is actually, there, there's what you would consider four major first empires of the world. And that was the first one, Mesopotamia with its capital being Babylon. And then um, we looked at Egypt as well. And Egypt wasn't considered a first human empire, although Egypt is very important in our human civilization, but not considered a first major empire because Egypt is still a very um, pivotal country today. And it's continued on for many, many years of how it has um, developed as a country. But today we're diving into what historians call the second major empire of beginning of human civilization, and that is the empire of Greece. Now, what I want to do first of all is share with you a little geography on Greece to get you a little idea of its ge geography. Let me show you a map. I would imagine a lot of you would know where Greece is, but let me show you on the map here. So here is Greece right here, right up here. There you go. So there's Greece. There is the Mediterranean Sea there, and you can see Egypt right below it. So that's Africa, the top corner of Africa. And over here is, right across from Greece, is what's known today as Turkey. Now, back then it wasn't known as Turkey, but today it is. And you can also see on this map, Greece. Although you can see it better down here, I believe. So I'm going to go down here. So you can see Greece. And that was the ancient Near East. And you can see Greece right there. So Greece is basically uh, mainland with some islands because this here this here is an island and down here is an island so greece is actually 83 percent mainland and it is um the rest is islands 
So the Greece is Greece is surrounded um, on most of its end by the Mediterranean Sea. And now the issue with Greece, its geography, is that um, unlike earlier civilizations, it doesn't have a very good environment for growing. It does not have a fertile environment. So um, essentially 80% of Greece is true today and it was true back then. 80% of Greece is mountains. It's a very rocky landscape and there is very little encouragement for agriculture. So the Greeks essentially became very skilled seafaring people and traders and they were a people of the sea and the sea was really their highway because it was their way of making a livelihood because they could not grow very well on their land so they had to go to the sea in order to um, get food make a living and provide for their families um, and this goes very contrary to Mesopotamia and Egypt that had the water there, the rivers there, and the land right for growing and producing food. Now, Greece did not. So the ge geography of Greece made it um, much more challenging for surviving and making a livelihood. Um, but they became very, very good at traveling the sea and um, they were they basically um, made a huge impact with the sea travel so that gives you a little bit of the geography of of Greece and basically where it's situated and what it looked like back then um, and Greece um, it's a big, big, big time um, society for influencing future societies and future history. Now, what I want to talk about today um, is I've got a, <clears throat> we're going to start at um, 2700 BC. So obviously last week I left you off at around 3000 BC with the pyramids in Egypt. And today we're starting at 2700 BC. And this is where we see our first civilizations. So 2700 to 1500 BC, we had a civilization in Greek called the Minoans. Okay, so the Minoans um, were the first civilization. I said minoans, not minions. You go back home, minions. Yeah, go back to your home, minions, where you can be happy. Anyway, yes, minoans, not minions, from the movie Despicable Me. Uh, great movie, I love Despicable Me. But um, we're talking about the minoans here, and they were around here. So you can see here on this map, you can see here where it says Minoan and Mycenaean. And you can see down there an island called Crete. Right there, Crete. So that is where the Minoans developed in that region, that island called Crete. Now, um, where did they get their name from the Minoans? The Minoans got their name from the king that lived on the island at that time. And the king that lived on that island at the time, his name was Minos. So they were named after him. So that is how they got their name and that is how they became known as the Minoans in Greek civilization. And now they were um, around for quite a few years. And then another group of Greek people came into the picture and they, they overtook the Minoans. And 
this group of people we refer to today as the Mycenaeans. Okay, so the Mycenaeans were around from 1500 to 1100 BC and they came in, um, invaded the Minoans and basically overtook them and put them out of business, so to speak. So they took over the Greek civilization at that time, the Mycenaeans. And if we go back to our map here, you can see here, Mycenaean. So the Mycenaeans are right in that area too. And that is um, where they came into the picture. And that's the time frame they came into the picture. And they were around to 1100 BC. And then historians try to figure out what happened to the Mycenaeans? And one of the things you're going to find out about Greek history is, one of the things you're going to find out about Greek history, and one of the things that is a difficulty for students studying this is, there is really nothing around to give hard evidence to these early civilizations. Um, there is no written documentation of any kind that really shows proof of these civilizations. But what the student has to go to is the two greatest resources the student has to go to to f discover the origins of Greek people are art and archaeology. And these two things have definitely uh, backed up these two civilizations existing. And now, the Mycenaeans, they were there from 1500 to 1100 BC. And then, what happened to them? What became of them? And there is many theories out there, okay, that explains what happened. Or theories that historians and scholars come up with to s explain what happened to the Mycenaeans. Okay? And one of the ones they come up with is an overuse of the land. So the Mycenaeans overused the land and overused it to such an extent that it caused deforestation, deforest, caused the land to become defor, deforest. Sorry, I have a hard time with that word. Deforestation, deforestation. Basically, overuse of the land. So that's one theory that they come up with, and they say, well, you know, they overused the land so much, and then the land didn't become very useful for them, and they couldn't survive anymore, and then they went poof into existence. So that's one theory. Another theory that scholars believe happened to them was a volcano on a nearby island, okay? So they believe a volcano on a nearby island island of Thara. There was an island called Thara. A volcano erupted there and um, and it caused tsunamis and the power of the volcano and the tsunamis just kind of wiped out the civilization as well. That's another theory. Now the third theory they come up with and it's the theory that seems most possible and plausible based on historical evidence is that the Mycenaeans were invaded by a group of people as well, just like the Minoans were. And they became invaded by a group of people known as the Doric Greeks. So the Doric Greeks came in, invaded, um, basically invaded the Mycenaean kingdom and overtook them. And actually, there's very strong proof of that because Later on, um, historically, these group of people became known as the Spartans. <clears throat> we're going to talk, we're gonna, I'm going to introduce you to Spartan and Athens at the end of this lesson, but um, those are your three theories for what happened to the Mycenaean kingdom. So, essentially, we get the Minoans coming in. They 
vanish and they they their kingdom doesn't last. The Mycenaeans come in, rule the Greece Empire for a while, and then they're not ruling anymore. And you got this third group of people called the Doric Greeks, who later become Spartans. And Sparta later on is a major city state of Greece. And I'm gonna that's at the very end of my lesson. Oh, what am I getting in my ear here? Something in my ear. Oh, it's time for the joke. Yes, Professor Banks forgot about his joke. So let's share our joke now. Usually I share it at the beginning of my lesson, but we got right into the lesson. So here, I'm gonna share the joke of the week. And since Easter is just around the corner, Easter is next weekend, I thought I would share a funny story about a bunny joke. So here is the joke. A man was blissfully driving along the highway when he saw the Easter bunny hopping across the road. He swerved to avoid hitting the bunny, but unfortunately the rabbit jumped right in front of his car and was hit. Oh dear. The basket of eggs went flying all over the place and candy went all over the place too. The driver, being a sensitive man as well as an animal level, pulled over to the side of the road and got out to see what had become of the bunny carrying the basket. And unfortunately, much to his dismay, the colorful bunny was dead. The driver felt guilty and began to cry. A woman driving down the same highway saw the man crying on the side of the road and pulled over. She stepped out of her car and asked the man what was wrong. I feel terrible, he explained. I accidentally hit the Easter bunny and killed him. There may not be an Easter because of me. What should I do? The woman told the man not to worry. She knew exactly what to do. She went to her car trunk, pulled out a spray can. She walked over to the limp, dead bunny and sprayed the entire contents of the can onto the little animal. Miraculously, the Easter Bunny came back to life, jumped up and picked up the eggs and candy, waved its paw at the two humans, and hopped on down the road. Fifty yards away, the Easter Bunny finally stopped, turned around, waved, and then he hopped on for another fifty yards. And he turned... And he waved, hopped another 50 yards, and off he went and waved again. The man was astonished. He said to the woman, What in heaven's name is in your spray can? The woman turned the can around so that the man could read the label. And on the label it said, Hair spray restores life to dead hair, adds permanent wave. <laughs> Oh my goodness. Love that. That's an awesome joke. So that's the joke of the week right there. And I, hopefully some of you get a chuckle out of that joke about the Easter Bunny. Okay. Back to our lesson. So the Doric Greeks came in. Took over the Greek Empire. And then after the Doric Greeks came in to take over the Empire... We enter a time period known as the Greek Dark Ages. The Greek Dark Ages. My goodness, Professor Banks, that sounds rather bad. Doesn't sound very good. But let me tell you, let me give you a brief nutshell about the Greek Dark Ages, why they were called the Greek Dark Ages. Okay, I'm going to go back to my board here. So the Greek Dark Ages went from 1100 to 800 BC. And why were they called the Greek Dark Ages? Okay, I, I got it written down there for you. And I'm just going to go run through the points for you, okay? So basically, there was no written... Get up there. There we go. No written language going on at this point in time. So what that also means is there's really no documentation of any kind. So 
you have no language going on, no documentation, and the people living at the time can't even remember much about the time period either. So that's one reason why they call it the Greek Dark Ages because none of this documentation and written language had really started to be developed. Now as we know back when we looked at Egypt, Egypt developed the first real system of writing hieroglyphics but it hadn't been at this point developed and written into any kind of language so we didn't have this language of any kind to go on. And then the next thing we had going on was just general poverty. Okay, so lots of poorness. Um, people were finding it very hard to struggle for a livelihood. People weren't that financially well off. And that has to do with the fact of the turmoil of the first type of people, right? The Minoans couldn't stay in existence. The Mycenaeans couldn't stay in existence. And this long-term effect of that caused poverty in the land of Greece. Nothing unlike today, actually, because Greece as a country financially is not doing very well today either. But that is another characteristic of the Greek Dark Ages. And then there is just general disruption going on. And uh, the general, the general, general theme of the time was it was just, it just seemed like a time going backwards. They weren't progressing forward. They were it just seemed like, uh, as a people and as a civilization, it just seemed to be going backwards instead of forwards. And at this point, there was really no society either. So, in this. Um, time period, the house was the center of life. And that was what life was about, just the house. You know, whatever families were living together, that was what life was at that point. There was no indra, there was no indra industrialization going on. There was no um, real written language going on. It wasn't really uh, many ways of making a livelihood during this time. So, we got the Greek Dark Ages. And further on down the road, as we continue on our history journey, we're going to see a much more darker age period that affected much more area. It's called the Middle Ages, but that's for much more down the road. But that was what the Greek Dark Ages was about. So, that went on for 300 years, 1100 to 800 BC. Just kind of that general theme of stuff and that, those kind of characteristics going on at that time. And then when we get into 800 BC, things begin to get better. Things begin to get a little better and things begin to pick up. And what happens in 800 BC is you got really the birth of classical Greece. That is what happened in 800 BC. So you had some very smart people that came along, some people that contributed to the society, and people that were able to get the society going in the right way. And now obviously... I'm going to share with the, I'm going to get into this in a future history lesson, but what I'm talking about is people like philosophers, and Greek was the, Greek was the birth of philosophy, so, you know, you got, um, sorry, I'm just looking for a note that I may have here. Okay, found it. So philosophy, people like Socrates, Plato, Aristotle. And then you had another, you had other smart people that were gifted with mathematics. And so they came on to the scene. People like um, Pythagoras and um, Euclid. And then um, we also had some 
people very gifted in the drama area coming onto the stage. People like Cephalikos, um, your, your people like Cephalikos, Euripides, and Astrophanes, Aristophanes. Sorry if I can't pronounce these names right, but um, you probably get the gist of the people, kind of people I'm talking about. And then, of course, those Doric Greeks that came in and invaded the Mycenaean kingdom um, started to um, become stronger, and they started to develop an area of their own as well. So, what happened in 800 BC? What broke this Greek Dark Ages is you got uh, colonies starting to become established because let's go back to the beginning of my lesson when I was talking about. Um, when I was talking about the people being very good at traveling the sea. So in 800 BC, the effects of those sea travels started to actually be seen because they started to colonize nearby islands and neighboring islands. And they started to found settlements among the coast of Anatolia, and which is also known as Asia Minor, which today is known as Turkey, which I showed you earlier on that map where that was. So that was the Greeks. That was the Greeks' influence. They traveled the seas, got into that area, started to found settlements, and then all of a sudden you got um, more countries rising onto the scene. And Asia Minor back then, today known as Turkey. Um, and then what you have happening is two, you have um, what's known as polis developing in Greece. And polis basically means city-states. So these places developed and started to have an influence on Greek and they started to, to um, have a say in the governing of Greek as well. Um, so, Sparta and Athens. Sparta and Athens. It's not interesting because um, how many places do you see today with that kind of influence? Like you see all kinds of products and places out there that embrace the word Spartan and you see some of that, some, uh, you also see some in our society from Athens as well, in a way today too. So Spartan and Athens, two, the first two real major city-states of Greece. And um, Greece now had a written language formed as well, if I didn't share that already. Um, and so that really helped them break out of this Dark Ages time period they were in as well. They started to actually, they, de they developed a written language. Thank you, Greece, for giving us written language. But um, to Spartan and Athens, let me talk to you a little bit about them. Okay, there's a big difference between the two of them. They couldn't be any more different um, polis or city-states at all. Completely different. Okay, so Sparta... Down here, if you can read this, I got a little bit there. So Sparta comes from the Dorians. And Spartan believed in slavery. Okay, so uh, ancient, um, the Mycenaean, um, remember Mesopotamia? Yes, Mesopotamia. These people... The people that used to be in Mesopotamia were now slaves to the Spartans. So they had slaves. The slaves did all the manual labor for the Spartans. So Spartans were kind of a brutal kind of people. They maybe mistreated people pretty poorly. And they used slavery a lot. And the kind of system they governed with was known as a dual monarchy. Okay, so... 
the people didn't really have much say in the governing of this type of society. It was mostly the higher ups that had all the say in how the society was run. And so slavery continued to go on in this um, region of Sparta. And now, um, and also another thing about Sparta is uh, Sparta really believed very strongly in men being soldiers. So a lot of the men were recruited to be soldiers. And um, so they, they wanted to develop a big, strong army. So the men went into service. And now the woman, women didn't really serve much purpose in the society at all back then. Um, in fact, the Spartans strongly believed that the woman's place was at home. And that the woman should stay at home, not have much interaction with the society, and they were not to work. So, that is how Sparta kind of, that was their philosophy, and that was kind of what they were like as a city-state. Now, on the other hand, on the flip hand, you had Athens. And Athens was quite contrary to that. Okay, so Athens, the big thing about Athens was democracy. Athens believed strongly in democracy and Athens governed by democracy. So democracy gives the power to the people. Okay, so the people had a lot of power in their hands, the citizens, as opposed to just the upper top people having the power and the say in governing the city. So that was two complete different ways of running things. You know, dual monarchy versus democracy. And thank you, Greece. Again, another applause for Greece. Because Greece was the first empire that utilized democracy. And what do we have today? We have democracy as well. So another strong influence on our society from Greece. And these people met a lot. They met up to 300 times a year to have meetings about things that were needed to be discussed. And they all made decisions together at these meetings about the kind of decisions that should be made for the city and for the state. Um, so that is a little bit of understanding of Sparta and Athens. And let me show you on the map. I should show you a quick view on the map too because I have a map here that shows Sparta and Athens. Okay. So let's go down here. And there you go. So you can see there is Sparta. And Sparta is actually on one of the islands, and Athens is over here. Sorry, right there. Athens. So Athens is above Sparta, and Athens is actually on the mainland. So, and again, another contrast between the two of them, one being on a mainland and one being on one of the islands. So... And now another, um, finally, one thing I want to say about the Spartans is the Spartans, another thing, they were very strong on war. And the Spartans, um, there was a problem they, they considered at this time, and they believed the problem was overpopulate, overpopulation. Too many people living in one area. So what... How are we going to solve this problem? Well, easily. They just solved it by war and conquest. So the Spartans, what they did was they fought a lot. And we had what was known as the First and Second Messian Wars. And what happened in these wars is they uh, fought in a region called Messian. Um, sorry. 
anyway, the, the what the Messian Wars was about was it was named after a region called Messia. Um, so they basically fought in this area and conquered it, and essentially they overtook this area. So Spartans very um, didn't believe in democracy, um, strong hold on slavery. Um, they believed, you know, if we want to solve a problem, let's just use war and violence to solve it. The Athians, much more peaceful, <clears throat> much more power of the people kind of thing. So that's the beginning of classical Greece with those two major city-states. And what did we have happen in Greece? Can anybody tell me, is there any sport people out there that would be able to tell me at all what happened in Greece? What was the significance of Greece in the area of sports? And if you answered this way, you'd be right. What they did was gave birth to the modern Olympics. So the first ever Olympiad was held in Greece in 776 BC. And, um, and how many Olympics have we had since then? Oh, many, many. I, I've lost count of how many there are. But again, it's Greece. Greece that developed the first Olympiad. So we have a lot to give thanks to Greece for in today's society. Um, so basically, that's where I'm going to leave you today. I'm going to leave you off at Classical Greece. Now, Classical Greece doesn't stay uh, peaceful for too long. And next week, we're going to get into um, a little bit of unsettlement. And when I'm going to show you, I'll talk to you about some conflicts that happened in the early years of classical Greece. And laid, and one of these actual conflicts involves Spartan and Athens themselves. So it's no surprise with Spartan and Athens being so completely opposite in their views and the way that they'd see things would come head to head, would butt their heads over something. And that happens a little bit further down the road. So that gives you a little bit of introduction to ancient Greece, classical Greece. And hopefully you learned something from this and I hope that you could take something away from this. Um, so next week we get into some of the early uh, conflicts of classical Greece. And so we're going to look at that together. And again, I encourage you, please leave some comments below. Let me know what you think. And hopefully these lessons are fun and enjoyable. Because it is fun with history. So until next week, take care. This is Professor Banks, signing off. <laughs>